Hello stats enthusiasts, welcome to another video in Unit 6, Inference for Categorical Data, focusing on proportions. We are going to be on Notes 6 today, where we are going to explore the relationship between a confidence interval and a significance test in the context of a proportion. If you're new here, I am Goldie, and I'm going to walk you through this connection today. So pull up a chair, grab some notes, and let's dive right in. To look at the relationship between confidence intervals and significance tests, I want to look at a problem and actually do both inference procedures on this problem. So for the first piece of this problem, we are going to construct a confidence interval. And for the second piece, we are going to run a significance test on the same problem and just see what our conclusions are and see what the relationship between those conclusions are going to be. So this situation, a recent study suggested that 77% of teenagers have texted while driving. A random sample of 15, 50 excuse me, teenage drivers at the school was taken and 33 admitted to texting while driving. Assume all conditions have been met. Use your calculator to answer the questions below. So we're not going to do the four C's um, for each of these inference procedures. We are just going to use our calculator to get the result and to conclude it. So for part A, we're going to construct a 99% confidence interval to estimate the true parameter of teens who text while driving. So to construct it, we only put three, three, three things in our calculator. So remember, this is the one prop Z int, right? So letter A, one prop Z int on your TI-84 or whatever statistical software you are running. Um, X and N are together make up our sample proportion and our confidence level is 99. And inputting that into our calculator is going to give us a confidence interval um, that looks like that. And then if we have a confidence interval there, we can, of course, interpret what that means. This means that we are 99% confident that the true proportion of teenagers who have texted while driving is between 0.487 and 0.833. Now, when constructing the confidence interval, we didn't use the 77% at all um, because it's what a study has already suggested. It's not actually what's going on in our sample proportion. We are going to use that 77% for part B, where we are going to conduct a significance test to determine if the proportions of teens who text while driving is different than 77%. And we're gonna use a 1% significance level. So to run this test on the, your calculator, first I just wanna set up our hypotheses um, and see, have you see that, okay, our null is equal to 77% and our significance test is just to see if there's a difference from 77%. So we are gonna use the not equal to for our alternative. In the calculator section, this is the information we are, we are going to put in. We put in our P naught, which is going to be our uh, null hypothesis. Our X and N make up our sample proportion. And then for prop, it wants to know what is your alternative hypotheses. And our alternative is not equal to that 0.77. And then what our calculator gives back is a few different um, pieces of information. The one we're interested in when we make our conclusion is the p-value. So it says the p-value is 0 0.065. And because our p-value is higher than our significance level, we are going to fail to reject our null hypotheses. We do not have convincing evidence that the proportion of teenagers who have texted while driving isn't different than 0.77. So on this one example, we did two inference procedures and we came up with two conclusions that maybe at first just sound you know, different. We did different things for each of them. We did use the sampling distribution of sample proportions. So what is the connection here between these inference procedures? So for part C, I have our two conclusions here. Uh, this one is from our confidence interval and this one is from our significance test. So 99% confident that the true proportion is between these two values. And what I want you to notice is that this true proportion that we had a claim for in our null hypotheses, that true proportion is contained in this interval. Okay. That true proportion is in that interval. So if it's in that interval, we remember for our confidence, that means that we 
are competent, that um, it could be a plausible value for the true proportion. And if it's a plausible value, that means we fail to reject that null. Okay? We fail to reject that it is 0.77. And that's where our connection is going to be. Our confidence interval gives us that interval of plausible population parameters. Our significance test that 70, said that 77% is still a plausible value, right? When we failed to reject our null, that didn't mean we accepted our null, but that's saying, hey, this is still a plausible claim. This is still a plausible value for our population, and we failed to reject it. So because our confidence interval contains that 77% as that population parameter, it agrees with our significance test. And here's where that relationship comes in more visually. So we made a 99% confidence interval um, from 0.487 to 0.833. And 0.77 was, I don't know, somewhere around here, right? So it's within that interval. Now the combined area is 1% on the outside, right? We have 0.5% in each of these tails that combine into 1%. Um, and that represents our quote unquote rejection region in our significance test. If our null hypotheses had fallen into this uh, rejection region, wherever it would be, then we would have rejected our null hypotheses. And we would have said that we don't, we do have convincing evidence that it's not equal to 0.77. So that's going to be your big connection between confidence intervals and significance tests. Now, what to see about this um, big connection too is that we use 99% confident and a 1% level of significance. So 99 plus one is 100%. <laughs> Woo, I know, pretty, pretty groundbreaking math there. But that needs to happen. We have to have our confidence interval level um, and our significance level add up to 100% in order to have these support each other, okay? Okay, so what needs to happen for these two to agree with each other, to come to that correct conclusion? Well, we use this kind of generic formula right here um, to show the relationship between our significance level and our confidence interval. So if we had a significance level like we just had of 1%, 1 minus 0.01 would be 0.99, and 100 times 0.99 is 99%, okay? So that's just kind of the formula we use um, for the significance level with the confidence level, um, but it just has to add up to 100, okay? The other important detail is your alternative has to be not equal to. This only works, they only agree with each other when you're looking at an alternative saying not equal to. If you have less than or greater than, um, this method will not work the way we are setting it up, okay? So your significance level and your confidence level have to add up to 100 and your alternative has to be not equal to. As long as both of those things are true, then the conclusions are going to support each other. So if you have a 90% confidence interval, you're going to use a 10% significance level with your alternative being not equal to, and your conclusions will align. 95%, 5%, 99%, 1%. Right. So you see that relationship forming. That has to be true. They add up to 100, and your alternative is not equal to. Okay. So let's do, um, we'll do one more example. Okay. Um, but I want to just kind of solidify what that conclusion connection is. If the confidence interval contains the null hypothesis from that two-sided test, we would fail to reject the null, okay? Because that's what we just did in our example. If it contains the null hypothesis, we are still saying that it is a plausible value. And if it's a plausible value, we would fail to reject it. Okay. We're not saying it is the value, which is why we never say we accept the null, but it's still a plausible value, so we're going to fail to reject it. If the interval does not contain the null hypothesis, I didn't cross that off, but if it does not contain the null hypothesis from that test, we would reject the null. Okay. We would say, okay, it's not a plausible value. We have convincing evidence that we can reject the null in favor of the alternative. 
So our example here um, is calling out a specific brand that makes a claim when their user plants their grass seeds, 88% of the seeds will germinate. Okay? This germination rate is defined as the proportion of seeds that, when planted in the fertilizer and watered, sprout and grow. So the company regularly tests this claim to make sure its product is efficient. They plant 500 grass seeds in their fertilizer and find that 412 of them germinate. And then it says, assume all conditions are met. So we're going to make, um, make our confidence intervals and significance tests with that assumption that all of those conditions are met. We won't have to check them. So part A, what is the 90%, 95% confidence interval uh, for this observation? So making that confidence interval, we have to put in our X, our N, and our C level into our calculator. And then we get out that confidence interval, 0.791 to 0.857. Perfect. Calculator gives us that nice and easy. Part B, suppose the company conducted a test of our null being 0.88 against alternative not equal to 0.88 using a 5% significance level. Now, the reason why a not equal to would make sense in this situation is they just want to test the claim. They just want to see, okay, is that claim correct? Or maybe did our germination rate increase or maybe our germination rate decreased too much um, outside of a plausible value for 0.88. So that's why it's not equal to. Um, we're going to use the confidence interval to determine whether this test would reject or fail to reject the null. So we're not actually going to run a significance test for this part. It wants us to use the confidence interval to make the conclusion we would normally make in the conclude part of a significance test. So as a reminder, our confidence level of 0.95 gave us this interval. So when we look at this interval, is our null hypothesis in this interval? That's the question you have to answer first before you come up with a conclusion. Is 0.88 contained in that interval? That's going to be a no, right? It is outside of that interval. Because it is outside of that interval, what is our conclusion? Well, if it's outside the interval, that means it's not a plausible value for our population parameter. And if it's not a plausible value, that means we can reject this claim. We can reject the null. So the reasoning that goes behind this, we say because our 95% interval does not contain 0.88, we can reject the null in favor of our alternative hypotheses. Okay. So remember, our conclusion is always, it starts always, it starts off always with some sort of statistical statement, and then we have to put the context to it. So we say we have convincing evidence that the germination rate of seeds is not 0.88. Okay. Now we can't say lower. Because I know you're, um, you kind of see this, the interval is it's lower than 0.88. So you're like, oh, the population parameter must be lower than 0.88 because all the plausible values are lower than 0.88. But remember your alternative hypotheses, okay? We always reject in favor of the alternative. So we say we have convincing evidence that the germination rate of seeds is not 0.88. If you say the germination rate of seeds is less than 0.88, you will not get full credit for that, okay? We have to be very specific with our wording and the conclusions we can draw from our test, okay? We don't wanna be misleading in that way. So we have convincing evidence of the alternative, which is not 0.88. If we go ahead and find the p-value for this test, explain what the p-value measures in the context of the problem. So finding the p-value, we will use our calculator there. Um, this is the information we would put into the TI-84. Our null is 0.88, x is 412, n is 500. Our alternative is not equal to. It gives us a p-value of this, <laughs> very small, 0 0.00012. And just explaining the p-value, interpreting the p-value in the context of the problem, we would say the probability that 412 seeds out of 500 will germinate if 88 per seeds actually germinate is 0.0012. So remember the p-value is the probability you get this sample proportion if the null is true, okay? And that's the, that's the probability right here. So it's the probability you get the sample proportion if that null is true, okay? So that's the um, uh, relationship between confidence intervals and significance tests. You can, like we did in part B here, um, 
have a conclusion to a significance test using a confidence level, um, but you really have to be careful with the fact that these have to add up, okay? If we made a 95% confidence interval and we used a 1% level of significance, they do not agree. We cannot use them to support each other. Or if our alternative was anything other than less than or other than not equal to, if it was less than or, or greater than, um, we also could not use a, a confidence interval to support it, okay? As long as those two things are true though, we can support it. Just make sure that you come to that conclusion correctly. And that wraps up our notes for today, going over the connection between a confidence interval and significance test. So I hope you learned some great things. In our next video in this unit, we are going to be talking about confidence intervals for a difference in proportions. So make sure to stay tuned for that video. As always, if you have liked this video, please click the like button and subscribe to my YouTube channel for more great AP statistics content. I wish you endless statistical success as always, and I will see you in the next video.